so why don't you give us like a, a an overview of the cognitive impairment in schizophrenia and, and sometimes in bipolar and depression as well. But you know, give us like a rundown of those uh, serious uh, impairments. Uh, tell us what is not impaired also, because I assume not all the cognitive uh, functions are impaired, but many of our patients fun day to day, they, they have functional, uh, functional abilities, but some of their functions are impaired. Why don't you tell us about the impaired functions one by one and, uh, and elaborate on them as you see fit? Well, let's start with the unimpaired functions because there are fewer of them. One of the things that happens is that crystallized intelligence is very well maintained in people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So what we see is that reading ability and vocabulary ability is essentially preserved at levels that are congruent with the amount of education that the person completed. Mm -hmm. What that lets us do is use someone's educational attainment or their vocabulary score as a reference point to look at other elements of cognitive functioning. Uh, the most impaired elements of cognitive functioning tend to be processing speed. What's interesting about processing speed is it's normal for processing speed to change over time. Older people who are in their 70s and 80s are often only half as fast as they were in their 40s, but schizophrenia patients in their 20s and 30s are doing processing speed tasks at the same pace as 75-year-old healthy people. So that's a major impediment and a true treatment target. Secondly, so it's, 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 it's memory. Uh, so, so Dr. Harvey, it, it sounds like patients with schizophrenia in their 20s uh, have a brain that, that resembles those in their 70s. That's processing speed. Uh, so it's like premature aging in a way? One of the things that's interesting about the cognitive impairments in schizophrenia is that the kind of cognitive abilities that change normally with aging processing speed, working memory, episodic memory, tend to be impaired at the outset of the illness in people with schizophrenia and not necessarily change over time. So it's not like, you can see why Kreplin would think it looked like dementia because the cognitive abilities of younger people with schizophrenia look like those of older healthy people or even those of people with dementia. But it's not dementia like Alzheimer's disease because the progression, if there is one, is limited to certain cases and to certain periods of time. But you're absolutely right. One of the arguments is, is schizophrenia a syndrome of accelerated aging? And there are other biomarkers that are sort of outside the realm of our discussion that go along with that, that are uh, things that look like they change in aging that seem to be impaired early in schizophrenia. Yeah, I'll give you an example because I've done a lot of brain imaging research. And one of the earliest findings in schizophrenia were uh, enlarged ventricles. Uh, and cerebral ventricles in the brain, which we see in people in their 70s and 80s, but we, we found them in young people in their 20s. That's another biomarker of accelerated aging in a way. And enlarged ventricles do tend to correlate with slowed processing speed, impaired working memory, and impaired episodic memory, you know, verbal learning in people with schizophrenia. So uh, another major impairment is working memory. People with schizophrenia have a very challenging time remembering information and keeping it in mind while they operate on it. So they have a harder time remembering phone numbers. They have a harder time managing directions. And you can see how this would impact on your work. If you're working with someone and they tell you to do three things in a sequence and you can only remember two, you're always looking like you can't do the job. And this is what happens with people with schizophrenia who get employed. Their employers sometimes misperceive and think they're not trying just because they can't remember what they're supposed to do. Yeah, and working memory is really a very important uh, type of memory. Can, can you just tell our viewers what, what are the various types of memories? And this working memory is the short term, shortest term memory, but there are many other types of memory and you might be discussing them later, but can you just list the names of it? Sure. Group? We'll start with the simplest form of working memory, which is just maintenance working memory. So if I tell you a phone number, you're being able to remember it long enough to dial is maintenance. But if, if for I, like two or three minutes, okay, that's what you or, mean. Or, or, even, or even 10 seconds. Or, or even, even 10, 10 seconds. seconds. And so both the retention duration and the retention capacity is impaired. So the reason that phone numbers are seven digits is because most healthy people can remember seven digits, no problem. But if you can't remember seven digits and you take a message for your employer and you hand them a phone number that's got six digits in it, no one can return that call. Uh, the next kind of working memory 
is maintenance, uh, is manipulation working memory, which is associated with the ability to sequentially perform tasks that you're instructed to, forget the stuff you've done, remember the stuff that's yet to come, and work your way forward. So if you can't remember whether or not you've done something and you, and you need to figure out whether that, that task is taken care of before you move to the next one, that's an impairment in, ma in manipulation working memory. Memory now, is so important. I mean, people take take it for granted. We should all be grateful that our brain does these things, you know, without missing a beat. Uh, but but we notice them in patients who suffer from psychiatric disorders. Absolutely. And then when you talk about the ability to acquire information for the longer term, after all, you know, every piece of information that goes into your brain is not stored. It's adaptive to not remember things you're never going to need again. If you stored every piece of information you were ever exposed to in your brain, your brain would explode. <laughs> so what happens is only a limited set of information goes from working memory to longer term memory. So when you're sitting in a classroom listening to a lecture, uh, your working memory and your attentional processes might detect the smell of the perfume of someone who's sitting next to you, but you don't want to remember that. You want to remember what the professor is saying. So you select the information that you want to encode, and that's the first important step of long-term memory acquisition is encoding, getting stuff from your working memory into the apparatus that puts it into longer-term storage. Uh, Dr. Harvey, uh, it's uh, maybe worth mentioning that the region of the brain that's responsible for those the cognitive functions. So what part of the brain is responsible for working memory and triaging and editing, you know, the memories, uh, for example, that, that you just mentioned? There are critical features of the frontal lobe that are involved in working memory. So the frontal lobe basically organizes sensory information uh, and allows the attentional processes to focus on the things that you want to concentrate on. And then the frontal lobe makes the decision as to whether or not this is something that should be forgotten or then encoded. And if it's encoded, it operates in concert with the temporal lobe and the hippocampus to refer information into the longer term storage areas of the brain, which are largely in the temporal cortex. So the frontal lobe exercises decision-making uh, all along, you know, quickly and, and, and handles all the input information, input it into the brain and, and connects with the temporal lobe and the hippocampus, as you said. So memory is a pretty complex function. It involves several brain areas. It's a circuitry thing. Now, obviously, if you get a lesion in your temporal lobe, like people who develop Alzheimer's disease who have atrophy in their medial temporal lobe and hippocampus, they learn the ability to learn new information. But in a, a, in a brain that's not lesion, there's a circuit that's operating, and the efficiency and quality of operation of that circuit depend, uh, controls both your working memory and your episodic memory. Now, once you've learned something, you have to be able to get it back to use it, right? So there's two ways you can get information back that's been stored. One way is to spontaneously recall it. The other way is to be prompted to remember it. So if you uh, need to think of, you know, what's the capital of Switzerland? You know, you need, to, you need to think of that in your brain. But if someone says, now is Rome the capital of Italy or Switzerland? Well, that's, that's a cued recall thing, right? Someone is asking you, is Rome the capital of Italy? And, and your answer would be, yeah, Rome's the capital of Italy. But if someone said, what's the capital of Italy? That would be spontaneous retrieval. The important thing for that is that people with schizophrenia have challenges in their spontaneous retrieval of information that are much greater than in their recognition memory. So one of the ways that you can work with people who have schizophrenia is to help them develop ways to cue themselves so they can remember things. When they learn something, if you ask them about it, they can remember it. But if you simply wait for them to retrieve it, sometimes they can't. Okay. So what other types of memory uh, are uh, impaired uh, before we go to the next uh, uh, cognitive test? Uh, you mentioned working memory in a various types. Is there a long-term memory problem in schizophrenia? Well, actually, one of the things that's very interesting about schizophrenia is that long-term storage of information does not seem to be disrupted. 
Retrieval can be disrupted, but the information does seem to be there. So if you, for the vast majority of people with schizophrenia, if you, if you figure out how to cue them, they'll be able to remember the information. And they also don't show what's referred to as rapid forgetting, which is what you see in Alzheimer's disease, where I read you a list of 15 words and five seconds later, I ask you, what was that word list? And you say, I have no idea. People with schizophrenia are able to remember five or seven of those 15 words. Healthy people might get nine of those words, but people with Alzheimer's disease will only get two the last two every time, because those are the most recent words. Uh, so the serial point. position effect that everyone knows about is sort of exaggerated in schizophrenia by virtue of a sort of flattened primacy, but a, a completely uh, preserved recency effect. 